All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second universities panel. My name is John Cunningham, and I have the pleasure today of moderating this panel. And today we have some fantastic uh, guest speakers. Hold on a second, guys. Let me. Can you take that clock off, please? Uh, actually, can you restart my slides? There we go. And can you take the clock off this monitor down here, please? Thank you. Okay, so on our panel today, we have, starting here on the right, we have Kim Grinfader, who is the chair of the Department of Interactive Media and director of UMverse at University of Miami. We have Dr. Haifa Mamar, who is the executive director of Emerging Technologies at Full Sail University. And we have Teresa Grandall, who is the assistant executive director of the Allen B. Levin NSU Broward Center of Innovation at Nova Southeastern University. So let's give them all a nice warm round of applause. Let's warm everything up here. Okay, so the, the idea behind this panel was that with, with, the, with the rapid, with, with the rapid uh, adoption of Web3 technologies, metaverse technologies, immersive technologies, you know, this is really putting an impact on universities and colleges and uh, workforce development programs. So we figured let's have a panel to discuss how this is impacting universities, and, and what is the role that, un that universities are gonna play in preparing um, the workforce for the metaverse. And so we're gonna talk about, we're gonna have a couple of questions we're gonna talk about, but what I wanted to first do is ask each of you to briefly introduce yourself and kind of what your role is in the context of the, the metaverse or immersive technologies. So Teresa, why don't we start at the end there? Well, first, thank you for having me. It's a uh, pleasure to be on this panel with uh, all of you. Uh, so um, my name is Terry Grandel. I'm the Assistant Executive Director of, um, of Operations for the Levan Center of Innovation. Uh, the Levan Center is a public-private partnership between Nova Southeastern University and Broward County. So a lot of the work that we do is um, on the non-academic side of the house. We are very much community focused. Um, so everything that we do is around innovation, technology, entrepreneurship. Uh, we are we drive economic development for the South Florida region, so we, we help the region. Um, and what we are doing is providing a one-stop shop for entrepreneurs. And to do that, um, technology is a big component, as I mentioned. Uh, so we have a cybersecurity range, we have a technology makerspace, and now we're building a volumetric capture studio. So our three technology focus areas are cybersecurity, AI, machine learning, and spatial computing, and everything under the umbrella of AR, VR, and XR. So um, that's where we are. So we are not only to pro provide the technologies for our entrepreneurs to be able to test as they build, but we're also conducting training programs, on, like, like I said, on the non-credit side of the house, um, and then working with our academic counterparts to help feed that into what they're doing. Hi, good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Haifa Mamar. I am the Education Director of Emerging Technologies at Full Sail University in Orlando, Florida. <laughs> and um, actually, what I do is that I oversee all the gaming and tech programs. Uh, so uh, the tech programs, we have uh, bachelor's and master's programs. Uh, we have the simulation and visualization, so augmented reality, virtual reality, extended reality, simulation and training. We have the artificial intelligence. We have cybersecurity and IT as well. Uh, we have master's in data science computer science, AI, and ML, um, and uh, usability, uh, and uh, mobile development, web development, the computer science regular, and then also from the gaming perspective, we have the game development and game design bachelors and masters. Uh, part of my job as well, uh, beside uh, overseeing all these programs and departments, is that I also work closely with uh, the partnership department, uh, because I work I handle all the partnerships that are emerging tech. So I work very closely with companies uh, that are looking at um, uh, ways to, like we do research and innovation as well uh, at Full Cell, more uh, I call it research and development. And the way I do it is that uh, I want to make sure that our students uh, get the opportunity to work on um, real world projects. I came from a traditional university. I did my studies in a traditional university. I didn't really have that uh, uh, opportunity, but then now times are changing. The world is changing, and we want to make sure that students really have hands on activities, work on real world projects, and are ready for the industry. So, part of my job as well is like 
look at what's out there, where is the industry going, and then uh, reverse engineer that into our program. So what kind of skills are needed in the industry, and then work with advisory committees, work with companies, understanding their needs, and then put those skills in the programs, all the academic programs that we have under emerging technologies. And we have several um, labs and facilities that will sell that are under the emerging tech umbrella. We know that because of COVID, a fitness technology was big. People were not able to go to the gym to exercise. So then this is where we saw the increase in surge of different fitness uh, companies. And they're all looking at technology and how to engage with their uh, users. So that's how we went into fitness technology. We have students working. So we are partners with Echelon Fit. And we have students working on projects. Uh, we also went into healthcare technology with Advent Health University. Uh, and then we do a lot of uh, simulation with Red Bull and Orlando Health. So there are so many <laughs> different programs. But that's kind of uh, what I do. Okay. Thanks, Haifa. Kim? Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so I am a, an associate professor at the University of Miami. Uh, my research area is really immersive media. I also chair the Department of Interactive Media. Um, so the Department of Inter Interactive Media has four pillars, data visualization, game design, immersive media, uh, and UX UI. And these have a lot of crossovers um, between one another into it. <laughs> the other thing that I'm doing at the university is I'm the director of UMverse. So um, UMverse is started off in 2019 as a partnership with Magic Leap. Um, we were the first university to create a formal agreement with Magic Leap, and we started working with them very early on. Um, we brought 107 Magic Leap One headsets onto campus, and we really started pumping a lot of it, um, of that into our research and our curriculum. Um, that then evolved into the UMXR initiative, which opened it up to other platforms, and now it's the UMverse, which um, has others. So we focus on um, driving research, um, in pedagogy, we are exploring um, using uh, VR as a, as a modality, as a teaching modality in the classroom, um, and obviously building capacity and getting our students um, ready for what's coming next. Excellent. Okay, so I've put up a couple questions here. This is really kind of broad-based just to get the conversation flowing. And what I'd like to ask those of you in the audience, we're going to go through these, and at the end, I want to save some time for some questions. So if you have a question, keep that at the end. We'll ask and you know, raise your hand high. It's kind of hard to see, but we'll, we'll do that towards the end. Um, so the first question, you know, we, we're hearing a lot about these pure virtual universities that are, that are popping up, um, organizations that are offering everything from you know, fundamental degrees all the way through specialized training. So how will virtual universities in the metaverse impact our education ecosystem. So who wants to go first, Terry? I, I mean, again, I'm not the academic uh, on the yeah. panel, but I think, you know, traditionally, um, higher ed institutions are a little bit slow in, in moving forward, and we know industry moves at a much faster pace. Uh, so I think some of this is going to force the higher eds uh, to, to move a little bit more quickly, right? right? So. We, you know, we've heard a lot of industries creating their own academies, creating their own universities, but I think some of it is happening within the metaverse as well. So how I think it's, it's going to force institutions of higher education to really look at what they're doing and say, if we want to stay up to par, we got to move a little bit more quickly. And it's just not the institutions, but the higher education system as a whole, right? Because from an academic perspective, any program has to go through accreditation. It has to go through this huge, long, two-year process to even be able to offer an academic program. Right. So how... I think it's going to force, as in system, um, to really evaluate that process and say, do we want to stay in this pardon, a little archaic way, uh, and say, okay, we really we got to move forward if we really want to impact the workforce. Absolutely. So Full Sail University is not a traditional university. We are uh, more, uh, we're different. Our bachelors are uh, 20 months on campus, uh, 29 months online, uh, and uh, but. We, we are like, we follow the same thing as like accreditation. We have to work with the DOE, DOE, make sure that everything, of course, it's a, like, and full cell is not new, it's 43 years old. So uh, we've been here for, for some long times. Um, but um, I think, uh, I agree with Terry. I think uh, our education system is changing. The good thing about um, how, um, at Full Sail, I'm not here just to talk about Full Sail, but like the education ecosystem. For us, it's very easy to quickly change, look for what the industry is looking for, 
and then quickly change or update our curriculum, update our courses, create new programs. Yes, we're going to have to go through the same process to get accredited, be able to follow to um, uh, offer these things. But at least we have that flexibility of updating things quickly compared to other universities where it takes them four years or more sometimes for their programs. Uh, but yes, virtual universities, I, I mean, now we're seeing more um, of a, uh, what we call like a more skills-based education yeah. Yeah. Uh, than, um, than really the kind of traditional bachelors or masters where like it's you have a bunch of gen eds and a bunch of other courses that you're teaching more, like now it's very specific into what the industry is looking for. We need someone in cybersecurity, then they're gonna be just going and learning more about cybersecurity. And I was here actually earlier for the other panel about a uh, university in the metaverse, and we were talking about that specifically is that there is kind of a trade-off <laughs> here, like, yes, those students need those skills, uh, but also they need other skills as uh, understanding teamwork, understanding uh, how, like, uh, entrepreneurship or other skills that are needed in the industry. Sometimes those skill-based skill only, where, like, you're getting badges or certifications are not, yes, they're going to help you get that job, but maybe you need more than that. Uh, but I think for virtual universities, um, and the education system uh, ecosystem, I think we all need to kind of start a conversation and see how we can all uh, collaborate together, make this change quicker, yep. and then have also the accreditation bodies also be part of this movement as well. Excellent. Kim? Well, I think universities are extremely resistant to disruption, um, to say the least. <laughs> Uh, the crowd chuckles. <laughs> Traditional I'm, universities, Kim. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I mean, if you've seen how much uh, disruption happened in the world in the past 20 years, universities are still holding on. That being said, I think the metaverse, particularly immersive media, is, um, lends itself really well to education, um, more than these previous disruptions uh, that we've seen. Last uh, year, I taught a class entirely in the metaverse. We gave every student in the classroom a headset, and we said, I will see you at the end of the semester. And we met every week inside the metaverse. Um, it was a religion class, um, a, it's an interdisciplinary class taught with a professor of religion, architecture, and myself with immersive media. We had students from all three um, departments together, and they had to learn about um, how uh, religion kind of created communities, and how can we replicate those those processes in the metaverse and how space matters in religion, sacred spaces, and how those spaces could be replicated in the metaverse. And there's a lot we can learn from the past and, 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 and put it in the future. And the class worked extremely well. This whole process of co-creation, um, we needed um, to have help of a software developer to get to where we want to go. Um, and allow our students to create these spaces that they wanted, that their imagination allowed it. But it's a little bit like teaching at Hogwarts. You know, anything you think that's possible, you could do. And it was really great. And I think, you know, once the software gets easier and, and things get um, up to par, it's really going to be something that's going to help uh, universities. And I, I think uh, there's a space for it, but it's not the same space that currently exists as a university. It's a new space that's inventing itself. Yeah. So um, it's not every class that can go into the metaverse and say, hey, I can just teach this in the metaverse. But some classes lend themselves particularly well. And we're going to have to invent some new classes. Agree. OK. okay. Um, I actually totally agree with you. Um, uh, I would say also we're dealing with a different generation. I think our generation back then, like we were used to that kind of education system where Somebody will stand, give us a lecture, and that's it. Now, this new generation of students, they're very techy. So being able to engage with them, finding some ways to engage with them and have them really get interested in what we're teaching them is very important. So we need to kind of use the technology, use XR or VR or AR, whatever um, mediums we have so that we can uh, engage. And then also... Um, most of these students as well are online, especially with the pandemic as well. We had to switch online. Uh, I mean, for Full Sail, it was not, uh, it was an easy switch. We had, uh, most of our programs are online. But, um, but then we were uh, dealing with a different problem is how are we going to engage with these students? Uh, how are we going to kind of spark that interest uh, in them and get them now really wanted to learn more about this or that? So uh, there are different uh, courses where, for example, 
physics. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to explain those topics, uh, but then what we did is that uh, we have one of our course directors, part of the uh, liberal studies actually, he started learning Unity and then he started finding ways on how to uh, teach physics. Um, and then, uh, so he built, we have four labs uh, for, that, uh, for that course specific. Specifically, and then what he did is that he uh, he created a four different, or actually eight different, for that four lab uh, four labs, two different modalities: one augmented reality, one virtual reality. We give our students their launch box, which means their computer, their headsets, and everything is part of their tuition. So creating the virtual reality. A component of it and then have them use uh, uh, the reverb, HP reverb was easy for them and then or for those who want to just use augmented reality, they can just use it with, uh, with their phones. But being able to speak their same language and like talk to them and try to um, um, deliver, like be innovative about like how to deliver the content. And I just want to, to, to your point, uh, to Kim's point about the collaboration component, I think, uh, you know, working in the metaverse is forcing different disciplines to work together, where traditionally in institution of higher education, you, you work very much in silos. As an example, uh, so NSU is building now a health simulation center, and it's interdisciplinary. It's fo fo forcing all the units. We have two medical schools at the university. We have both an MD, a DO, and a lot of other health science programs, almost everything. So... It's forcing all those units to come together as they build the simulation center for the tools, the curriculum, the component, because at the end of the day, the real world is not a silo. So I think that's forcing, you know, using these emerging tech, it's forcing that component where um, it's a, the disruption of the interdisciplinary work has been very difficult traditionally. Well, I mean, competition always helps drive innovation, right? That's, <laughs> that's part of it. I mean, so, so you guys want to do something fun, right? To tell how willing, if professors aren't willing to adopt the technology, it's not gonna get into the curriculum, right? Because who writes the curriculum? The professors, right? So what you do is you, you, you take all the professors in an auditorium and you take a VR headset and you say, who would like to put this on? Watch what the reaction is, because I've seen this, right? You, you bring a VR headset to someone and they're just like, they don't wanna touch it. It's just the nature of, of humans, right? So, so John, it's interesting that you bring that up. That is the biggest challenge. I know that's that the next question that's coming up. That is the biggest challenge that we face at university is a professor to just get, take that first step. Okay. So how do you incent them? How do you, how do you get those professors? I think building a kind of like um, a course, like for example, like going outside, for emerging tech, I would say my departments are always very, um, curious and they want to try new stuff and they want to implement new things. But then working with other departments like the liberal studies or other, and then show them, actually in our case, the liberal studies, that instructor specifically from liberal studies was the one who started building and then he got emerging tech in, included later on where like, okay, you build this, let's see how we can incorporate this in so many other courses. Um, but I think having some kind of a use case where people see how is this impacting our students? Because doing it just for fun is not gonna help. We need to see data. We need to see that this is helping our students in terms of education. This is helping our students in terms of pass rates. This is helping our students in terms of en engagement. This is helping our students where we're decreasing the drop rates. There are so many or at graduation, so we're seeing that they're learning the skills and that they're uh, really engaged and happy to learn instead of like being out there and just like bored. Well, isn't it kind of funny that, you know, when you're in the education industry, you know, it's about educating and getting people to try new things. And sometimes the educators are the le most resistant to change. Yes. Right. That's true. Yeah. yeah. That's true. Teresa, did you have? Well, I think I, to your, to, to the same point is the, at, having a few faculty that can really help advocate for it, right? So finding the two or three that are really passionate about the work that they do, have them adapt. And then I think part of it is the tangible component, right? You say, hey, these are great. You can do whatever you want. That's a big menu of things that you could do. So I think sometimes it's hard to make it tangible and make it understanding of like, what do you mean by that? Like, I don't, I don't know where to go. I, 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 you know, how do I use this for chemistry, for example? It's like, well, here's, you know, imagine having a chemistry lab in the thing. And then you have to like really paint by numbers, if you will, um, to some extent for those first few that can really then serve as your advocates within the rest of the faculty. To add to that, I think uh, universities need to have uh, a department that's specifically for those types of yeah. things where like they help create content yeah. and help the platform because 
if we're dealing with uh, traditional professors who are very scared of change, then they will be always resisting, saying that, that they don't have the skills to do it. But building kind of a shell for them or skeleton, this is kind of what you're going to be teaching. Just tell us what are the labs. Maybe we can brainstorm together, come up with ideas, and like help them build that course and educate them as well. Yes. Like and I they think industry to... too, right? Industry of course, has of uh, talks a big talk about, oh, higher ed is not producing what we need and so forth, but they're not truly buying in and investing in their, whether it's time, talent, whatever it is, um, in helping it, it create. So I think that's another, like, to your point with the resources, right? So it's not just saying, hey, this is all the stuff that you could do because like you mentioned, they're the ones then creating the curriculum. It's just additional work. But if you're providing the resources, whether it's an internal team or some of the industry partners saying, here's how we can help you create, it, I think, you know, just making it as easy as possible to adapt the new trend. Yes, I agree. I, I, I agree with everything. I think it's, it's also not only the resistance to change, but also the lack of vision sometimes. Um, they have a discipline that they've taught the same way for the past 300 years. Um, <laughs> we were saying this earlier. And, and <laughs> it hasn't changed and evolved and, and, and really, so how, how do we do this? So one of our goals is like, it's step by step. Exactly. And one of our goals is we're going to be teaching eight classes in the metaverse the same way across all campuses in school next year. And one of them is an art history course. And, and we, I sat down with the art history professor and he said, what can we do and things like that. And, and we, we, we worked on her curriculum. And she said, well, one of the things I'd really like my students to do is to be able to see the art in the original place where they were intended to. So we're designing Roman villas and castles for this course so we can put pieces that are in our art museum at, on campus, the Roman pieces in our art museum on campus, in a Roman villa so they can see it in the original place. Oh, that's clever. And, and kind of like thinking about it and thinking about it in a smart way of saying, how can we extend that and make it? So we have architecture students designing Roman villas. That helps them. You know, we have some of our students scanning 3D objects and kind of doing photo uh, photogrammetry and kind of learning about those skills. and, and you know, as you said, we need people from the entire university working together on these things. Otherwise, it doesn't work, and it's just going to break down the silos. Right. So, so I think one of the misnomers when we talk about the metaverse is that it's all this digital universe. We, we forget that the largest use of the metaverse is augmented reality, right? Today, when you go buy a product and you use your phone and you project the product into your living room, that's using augmented, that's, that's metaverse technology. So that has a huge role in supplementing traditional courseware, right? To be able to wear some augmented reality glasses or to be able to augment a class with, with 3D models that you're using on your phone? Do you see a role for that? For me, it's like, yes, all of the above. All uh, of the above. Yes. Uh, we need to provide some kind of ways for students. We need to make it easy for them, whether through tablet, phone, augmented reality, virtual reality, anything, web even, whatever it is, so that we can get them into the education and have them learn. Um, yes. I mean, we're incorporating it at the Innovation Center. We're, we, so the center, not only are we helping entrepreneurs, but we serve as a testing ground for industry, for ac the academics mm -hmm. as well. Um, so we have augmented reality experiences throughout just to give that, you know, spark that vision, if you will. Um, and, and now we're, we're building the volumetric capture studios. That way they can start creating their own content. So again, this goes back to providing the resources. But yes, I think, I think part of it, too, is defining the metaverse for um, for our groups, right? Because right. the metaverse means a lot of things and people use it interchangeably. And like you That's said, right. most people automatically think, oh, like, I'm an avatar in this digital world, like a real player one. But there's so many components to the metaverse. And, sure. and I think that's even step one to overcome some of these challenges is explaining the different ways to um, use the, the metaverse. I think that, um, so AR is, is harder um, than VR, I think. Um, but there's also like some opportunities. Um, our students don't like to read anymore and you can't read in the metaverse. It that's just true. doesn't work, the displays aren't there and, and things like that. But in AR you can read and I, there's no reason why Today's textbooks, you can't pull out 3D objects out of the textbooks and kind of look at them in, in, in 3D and things like that. Um, the previous presentation here was about um, the hollow anatomy, which is a case Western technology, which is a multiplayer um, system. It, it, you know, there's a lot that can be done, especially in the medical areas, where you want to have collaboration and people working together and, and have this mix of real and, and the real world and, and augmented. Okay, <laughs> change gears a little bit on one of the challenges. Um, so, all of this 
metaverse te technology requires technologies. Are universities equipped to deal with the additional burden of managing this new IT infrastructure? I think <laughs> that was a loaded question. <laughs> that is. I'm like, okay, where are we going to start here? <laughs> As, I'll start. Just talent acquisition is difficult. And, and no matter what you're talking about, so that's, that's a whole other challenge. Amen. Please. We were talking about, like, how are we going to get people like, to hire people? Go so ahead. We're both hiring. I'm hiring an assistant associate <laughs> professor um, in immersive media. So if, come talk to me if you are Yeah, those of you out there watching this online, remember we yeah. have a lot of people attending virtually. Uh, both these organizations have said, hey, we're hiring. Can we... Say that message? Full Absolutely. Sell, yes. Full Sail University is hiring in all emerging tech programs. So please, 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 we need people. And uh, for me, I would say for uh, how universities are handling the metaverse, I think one big thing, first of all, is that we need to educate everyone on yeah. like what we're talking about, what is the metaverse, and so on. And then uh, the second thing is that we need to understand the technology. Uh, so for me, uh, what do the industry, or like the industry needs people, we're going to talk about Orlando. We are part of the ecosystem. University needs to be part of ecosystem. So understand what is uh, the need out there in the industry, what kind of skill set they're looking for, and then build that in their programs. Um, so having, if the metaverse is like, this is where we're going. I mean, Orlando has been the hub of simulation for yeah, long, a, years, long, yeah. <laughs> a long time. So we are already doing that from the gaming, uh, um, where, like gaming industry to simulation industry to the military uh, to the education. We're all there already in Orlando. So um, I think all working together, understanding what the ecosystem needs, and then understanding what is the technology. So at the beginning, I remember um, early this year, 2022, we had Kathy Hackle come on campus and give talks about the metaverse. And for me, I was like, okay, I keep hearing this thing about the metaverse, and I'm like, okay, I had, um, like I was talking to Kathy Hackle, and I'm like, I know she's a strategist, I know she's like more looking at um, uh, where we're going and so on, but then I'm like, for me, I'm like, okay, if universities are going to be offering something, like a program in the metaverse, what kind of skills? And she helped me, I'm, she's like, you need to look at the business side, you need to look at the technology side. There are so many different ways how you're gonna be looking at the metaverse. So you decide which way you're gonna approach that from the metaverse perspective. So then we're starting then, okay, then let's look at the business side. There are NFTs and crypto and blockchain and all of that. Let's educate people on all these different technologies and what that means. There is the technology, what kind of technology it is to build a metaverse, what kind of skill set is needed to be part of this industry. And then understanding all that. And then from a university perspective as well, I think being able to host some kind of events like this, mm -hmm. understand the technology, support that technology, I think is very important. Well, universities have such, uh, I'm gonna use the word abundance of resources, but universities have a lot more resources at their disposal uh, between all the different entities on a campus to, f to host those kind of things, mm -hmm. to bring the community in, to bring industry partners in and, uh, and collaborate. Kim, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, so um, you were asking about IT. Um, I think it's more about access, is, is how do we manage these resources in a smart way? And what we're doing at the University of Miami is really um, leveraging the library. And the library is really, um, we have um, over, I think, 120 Quest 2s there. Um, we have HoloLens 2s and a lot of uh, other resources that students can just come out and check out. Um, most of these are used by classes, so the entire class comes in and checks them out. Uh, but faculty can get that support that they need there at the library. The library is, is, is really uniquely suited for these things. And, and if you're planning to do something like this at your university, I'd recommend talking to them and not going it alone. Okay. All right, so let's go to the last question and just kind of you know, talk about that. But what are some of the things that traditional universities are doing now? And, and it may not be something that you're doing in your university, but something you've seen that you think is really going to help help drive this yeah go ahead so I'm gonna just flip this question over and say some of the things that traditional universities are not doing now no. okay and, and, <laughs> and why we are like why UM is kind of like pushing so hard on this is that the metaverse is going to bring an in like I think uh, 
city said it's going to be thirteen trillion econ uh, thirteen trillion dollars the, the economy of the metaverse in, by twenty thirty, and these are going to be new jobs that don't exist yet. Um, how do we train our students to kind of be ready for this and 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 understand that there's a whole new world that's going to come up, and literally a new world that's going to be created. There's going to be an economy in it, and 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 there are going to be new jobs there that we don't can't even imagine. And how do we get them ready for that? How do we give them that flexibility and that resilience to adapt and be successful in this new world? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, they all learn unity. That's a good step in the right that direction. Is a <laughs> <laughs> At least. Nice good. one, John. Yeah, I got that one in there, huh? Well, I think NSU is a, a unique perspective, right? So we have a, a little bit of a reverse model. 70% of our students are graduate level students and 30% are undergrad. Okay. Um, so it's a little bit different than your typical. And I think that um, also helps with the adaptation of the emerging tech, which like I said, we're, we're building a, uh, it's a 100,000 square foot health simulation center and it's gonna have the metaverse components. There's the AR, the VR, the AI, it's all incorporated. And then our center of innovation is, like I said, the testing lab for some of that. So. Um, I, I think, to your point of what they're not doing, is, is still the, the conversation with industry and, and how do we, what do we know what's out there, right? Because um, industry is using resources and, and tools that not all institutions have accessible. So how do we work that, make it accessible so they're learning, that learning curve when they go to the workforce is as narrow as possible, right? Because a lot of times there are resources, there's equipment in, in the university, um, but by the time they get to the workforce, they're like three models ahead. Yeah. Uh, and now there's a learning curve. So how do we can maintain that communication and that, that pipeline of uh, matching industry and um, education? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a pause here for a second. Are there any questions in the audience? If you have a question for the panel, please raise your hand. OK, yes, sir. Speak loudly, please. Yeah, OK, I'm very good at that. I'm Professor Kevin Deggie of you, you are very good at that. <laughs> I hear you loud and I've clear. been teaching for a long time. Um, the, I don't know if this is a question or a statement, but I, I agree with almost everything I've heard in this room this morning. Uh, we face a lot of challenges as instructors. We are, we are as time-bound as everybody else out there. And so the, I, I switched to my research focus to VR as soon as the Vive came out and I could get my hands on one. It's like as soon as I put it on, it blew my mind, and I immediately didn't sleep for several nights because my brain was ticking about how can I use this to improve the way that I help students learn. Because like Aristotle said, I can't teach you anything. I can only make you think. Uh, and that, that is our job. But the, the constraints that I come into is I don't get release time to learn how to do Unity. So I, I got the license for Unity when I first started. But I was like, I don't have time to learn to do Unity. I have classes starting in a couple of weeks. Right. Uh, so how do I start creating content when I don't get release time for new uh, curriculum? How do I get the resources so that I can, I guarantee you, I can't put a headset in all of my students' hands. I, I work at a very small university, state, public funded, you know, all those things that are, are, are challenges. Um, and then the third thing, and, and you'd have to be an instructor to understand this, I think, my peers don't understand that my research in virtual reality requires a different kind of publishing. You know, yeah. for me to publish a journal article is the biggest waste of time that I have. I publish to YouTube, I publish to LinkedIn, I publish to, you know, all these digital things because frankly, by the time it goes through that publish cycle, it doesn't matter anymore. Okay, it, right. It's I'll obsolete. It, yes. uh, so those are the three things that I have personally faced as a challenge. Uh, and the other is managing by spreadsheet, uh, which yeah. that's a whole different conversation. Oh. But I mean, if there's any ideas about that. Oh, great, it's great never input. a good idea to give me a microphone. In my, in, in my previous role, I used to work at a different institution. I used to always tell the faculty, I was like, if you want to get something done, write a grant about it, because then it, you're forced to do it, because it's a contract. And it's like, sorry, university, I need to have release time because it's in the grant. Um, didn't always work that way. I'm making it a lot easier, sound a lot easier than it actually is, and I know that. Um, but I, I would, I, because of the research component and, and even to acquire some of the equipment, there are a lot of 
grant opportunities that will provide that to you where you can provide the equipment and get the, the research and will help with the publishing component as well. Um, so that's, I, I spent 15 years in grants and that's why I can, that I always go to grants as, as a default um, because it does provide that additional, and then it also forces the institution because once you get it awarded, now it's a contract. That's, those are my two cents. Good input. Yeah, a grant is a good way for course buyout. Um, also, um, universities have to find different ways to evaluate uh, faculty like you, um, either through creative output. Um, you know, publishing in, in YouTube and, 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 and blogs like that is difficult because it's not often peer reviewed. But um, you know, cr there are a lot of creative output, creative competitions and awards that um, UM does offer a track like that that you know allows for alternative ways of being peer reviewed. Um, and you know, sometimes it really depends on the university. Um, to do that, but there are other ways to look at it and maybe talking to your dean or, or the APB board might be able to help you with that. Yeah, I would say, uh, I mean, um, Tulsa is big about innovation. Like, we want these ideas. I was going to say, as you're talking, if you were talking about the Vive back then, I'm like, I need more of you, come work with us. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, I would say go to the head of the department, try to explain what this, how this is going to impact your students and how this is going to impact the education. Um, and then get them interested and then have them be the advocate uh, for what you're trying to do. And I, and I think there's still a perception um, in higher education that this is all gaming technology. It's all just, Which is, yes. it's, you know, it's yes. Beat Saber. It's, you know, they don't, you know, a lot of people still don't fully understand it. But when you have that aha moment, like the, the lady that was up here previously, from Case Western, when you have that aha moment, you're not going back, right? The, the, the next generation of the internet is gonna be real-time 3D, full stop. Everything's gonna be 3D. Um, so that's, um, you know. Anyway, other, other question. Any other questions out there, comments? Yeah, there's a hand. Yes, a hand. Uh, I've got a microphone over here. Is that is that Carolyn? I know that I know that. Is, accent. Is, I can yes, she knows, she knows. but I kind of recognize her voice. <laughs> Talking about creating curricula and fully aware of the time restraints of faculty and universities, K through 12 teachers. Is this not possibly an opportunity to engage our students in recreating that existing curricula in immersive technology, so they not only learn the curricula, but they're learning the technologies? Is that a way to perhaps approach it? You mean learn by doing? Learn? What an amazing Whoa, thought. What Whoa. a concept. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I, I love this idea. Sometimes um, um, uh, at Full Sail, we try to do like proof of concepts, where we have our, our, uh, our education system is based on project and portfolios. We need to make sure that students are working on hands-on projects as they are uh, after they learn those skills. So we have lots of projects that are proof of concepts of things that we're trying to build, tools that we're trying to build to be used then <laughs> later on. But um, one thing that we did at Full Cell, we helped uh, Advent Health University. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, students, nursing students could not go on campus to practice their skills, so they needed virtual training. What happened is that our emerging tech students built those virtual training for Advent Health University students, and then they were able uh, to, uh, so uh, Advent Health uh, University students were able to practice all those skills. We won awards this year at ITSEC with Unity, uh, made by Unity, made with Unity, uh, and uh, and uh, that helped them a lot actually uh, as well, uh, and uh, helped other universities. So be part of that system and have our students involved is yes. And, and by the way, that was Carol Ann from University of Central Florida. She was on the, one of the earlier panels. You know, Carol Ann, you guys have seventy-two thousand students, right? <laughs> You could create a lot of content. <laughs> well, I think that that's another one, working collaboratively with other institutions, because not all institutions have programs to help students, to teach the students yes. to create. Yeah. So how do we work together and say, OK, UCF, why don't you get, grab some students that help X, Y, Z, and so forth, just as an example. I think that's another opportunity. And I think also faculty have to be open to um, admitting that they don't know everything. Um, and that you know that it, it's it's okay um, that you can learn together 
and, and, and explore with students because there's just so much that's coming out at all the time. But sometimes you can just point them in the right direction and say, let's learn this together and use the classroom time for this and kind of figure out um, how to do things in the classroom as well uh, by doing. Yes. One more question? You have it. Okay, first one to the microphone or who speaks the loudest? So, hello, my name is Roberto, I'm deafblind. I work with sign language interpreters, well, actually pro-tactile interpreters. Um, I also work with state governments as a consultant, um, working for individuals with disabilities, support services, specifically in universities and colleges. And one of the biggest impact um, on individuals with disabilities, especially for deaf and hard of hearing students, is the availability of interpreters near their campus. So I'm wondering, is uh, the, I guess this is a comment, I think there's an opportunity in AR to have accessibility through AR for deaf and hard of hearing students uh, to have a virtual interpreter. We can see everything in the classroom, but also have the interpretation in the uh, augmented reality. And I think that would be an immediate uh, solution. And I'm wondering about your perspective on the capacity to do so. That's a phenomenal comment I question. Love well done. This. Yes. Can we, we have to answer it quickly, though, if we can do that. Yes, 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 we should have that. Uh, we try to have accessibility in uh, everything that we do, all the courses and so on, but adding that to augmented reality is a big yes. Yes. Yes, we're actually working with the Dan Marino Foundation who focuses on emerging technologies for uh, people with disabilities of all types, whether it's neural or physical, um, for that, because we're trying to increase accessibility for, especially with the emerging tech. I agree. Um, I think this is uh, uh, something that should come soon, and, and hopefully we'll see it. And this is definitely one of the technologies, and this combined with artificial intelligence and machine learning c and haptic technology oh can gosh. completely transform um, humanity, yes. if you look at it from that perspective. So with that, we're going to close the panel discussion. Thank you all very much. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it. Thank and thank you all for, for attending. Have a good day.